Hello all, uh, this is a video about a specific wear type named fatigue wear type. It's also called rolling contact fatigue. The different fatigue mechanisms causing wear. So the, the, the question we are going to ask ourselves in this video is if wear can take place without surfaces touching each other. So without surfaces coming into contact, can the two surfaces still be worn? Well, since I made a video about it, uh, they can, of course. So, so you, you may get something named subsurface or surface initiated fatigue. So I'll try to explain that. Take a, a machine component like a, <clears throat> a roller bearing. <clears throat> uh, every spot on the raceway or in, and also on the, uh, on the rolling element, of course, is exposed to repeated loading from zero when, when the roller is not there at all until gigapascal levels in milliseconds over and over and over again. It's millions of, of repetitions of this uh, load. And as you remember from uh, fatigue, from the solid mechanics, uh, <clears throat> having a repetition like that uh, may lead to fatigue. <clears throat> when, uh, if we look a little bit more into the details here, we have a, let's assume that we have a cylinder in contact with a, with a, a, a plane. It could be a roller in contact with a raceway in a bearing. Then you, you get the Hertz pressure distribution that looks something like this, in theory at least. <clears throat> uh, and the stress field underneath the surface looks something like this. You remember this from the contact mechanics videos. So, so uh, when the surfaces are perfectly smooth, you actually get the highest effective stress some distance down here. And uh, <clears throat> And uh, you can also estimate the maximum phonesis stress, the maximum effective stress, to be a little bit more than half the, uh, the hertz, maximum hertz stress, which is up here. If you also add some friction, you, you further increase the stress level, you increase the effective stress, since you also now have stresses, friction stresses on the surface. You, you also you increase the maximum, but you also move the maximum closer to the surface, which is not very good because the closer to the surface, the, the bigger the risk is to, to excite cracks up here to start propagating and form, form a, a damaged, a spall off a piece of material. It will become even worse when you when you add some some roughness on the surface. If you have some asperity, you will create a uh, a pressure peak, uh, so it, you will have an additionally high pressure here, uh, and that local pressure will move the the maximum stress. Not now, it's not tear anymore. It moves actually up to the surface itself, and the, in this specific case, you have seen that the maximum stresses have grown pretty much, and that is uh, that is important from a fatigue point of view. That increase will of stress will definitely increase the risk of of fatigue. So, and and then if you have both asperities and friction, you will uh, will further increase the stresses in the materials. <clears throat> of course, in a real surface, you have you have a number of yeah, it looks like a hedgehog, this pressure distribution. So you have a number of, of uh, pressure peaks and that will create local, local stress uh, concentrations along the surface here. <clears throat> if you have uh, two rough surfaces and they, uh, they are lubricated, you, the, this hedgehog may look like this. This is a computer simulation of two rough surfaces in contact in a lubricated contact so so the this this curve shows the film thickness uh, along the contact and this 
rapidly varying blue thing is the contact pressure so so of course if if you uh, the varying pressure will also vary the the stress in a specific point of the material and you, you vary it not only due to the big well this is the this is the kind of contact itself but you also see that it varies inside the contact very rapidly so this will also increase the risk of fatigue but this is the reality uh, an EHL elastohydrodynamic lubricated contact is operating normally so it's uh, normally when you when you plot a curve like this it looks as, a, as the pressure is constant but you should have this in mind <coughs> well this is more a better picture of the reality I would say okay so what is happening then uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, illustration of how a crack is uh, propagating and and re giving you a, a a damage of the surface so starting with this surface you have a you have a you have an asperity here or uh, and you have uh, uh, the counter surface here after some repetitions, you form some start crack, it starts to, uh, to propagate here. It, it may start at uh, some kind of impurity. You, maybe you had some kind of a, uh, impurity of the, of the steel material here, and the crack was able to start of that reason. And then when, when you go on more and more repetitions, the crack is growing and it grows and it eventually it reaches the surface and uh, it may spall off a piece of material in the in the surface and you create a pit so creating pits uh, is an important word here because this this process of fatigue is normally named pitting or micro pitting we are going to talk about the difference between the two but but making pits by pitting is is what is happening in fatigue wear this is a, a picture an SEM picture of, uh, of micro cracks at the surface so here you can see that uh, that the, the cracks has they have reached the surface so and uh, in this case they may have even started at the surface and propagated down through the material <coughs> And you can see that it's a little bit uh, funny effect is that the, the crack angle here is no, uh, normally the same everywhere and that can be explained in different ways i'm not going to get into that here uh, here you have a, a a number of uh, it's not the same crack it's uh, very difficult to to catch the same crack when it grows especially if you want to do it in a sem it's impossible of course but uh, these are various uh, uh, cracks at different stages of uh, propagation of the of the crack so so here down here you can even see that the, the crack has been or a pit has been formed the here is it's about going to be formed and here it's an early, more early stage of the formation of the crack and the pit this is an example of micro pitting uh, um, coming back to what the difference between pitting and micro pitting but this is a typical appearance of that so you can see that uh, that cracks has, has started here at the surface and and then it spalled off some small small chunks of, of metal and formed small pits so it's th these pits are pretty small normally you see here the the size they are tens of micrometers wide while the pitting type is a million could be millimeter size this is normally uh, the micro pitting is normally seen as a kind of frosting of the surface it looks it looks frosted so that so you can see it with your eye because you have so many pits there normally so what is the difference then between micro pitting and pitting well if it's subsurface initiate you remember that uh, that since the stress maximum for a 
perfectly smooth case. Uh, the ma stress maximum occurs a little bit into the material. So if you have relatively smooth surfaces, you may have this subsurface initiated type of fatigue. So it starts below the surface where the stresses are the highest and the crack grows up to the surface and and uh, and then it creates a pretty big chunk it takes away a pretty big chunk of metal and so it forms a big a large pit and that's what we call pitting and this is what you originally originally designed the rolling element bearings for and the life model was uh, uh, designed for so you so this type of pitting is typically found in bearings at least uh, earlier nowadays it's you hardly uh, you hardly get this uh, type of pitting because uh, the metals or the the materials are becoming so good they you don't have any much impurities so instead you have more surface initiated pitting and that comes from the from the rough surfaces or particles so it's uh, so if you have some yeah. Again, as you recall from the contact mechanics, if you have this concentration of stress coming from an asperity, you create a, a stress concentration at the surface and you get a, a fatigue process at the surface. So it's the, the cracks are growing from the surface into, into, into the material. And, and uh, then it forms pretty small pits, so it's a tens of micrometers, and of that reason we call it micro pitting. <clears throat> of course, if you keep on keep on making, uh, you keep on creating uh, micro pits, you you eventually create a big pit, so it could look like a micro pit also. You find this both in gears and in bearings. It's a typical failure mode of, of both gearboxes and rolling element bearings. The, as I said, the bearing life model is, is based on the fatigue properties. Uh, it, uh, nowadays they also take a, the surface initiated uh, fatigue into account, but originally the C number for uh, the dynamic load rating number was is based on, on on the pitting resistance for the material. So the C, as you may remember from uh, bearing theory, is that the C number is the load that gives you a million revolutions life. So, uh, so if you have slightly lower load than that, you will get a, a longer load. If you have a high load, you will have a shorter, uh, shorter life. But then there are also uh, factors like uh, cleanliness and viscosity uh, that could change the, the load or the the life of the bearing but and also the reliability you are looking for if you want to have very high reliability you may uh, you may you may design you need to design it for that too so you have you have to you have to make use a bigger bearing that you actually need in order to have a very high reliability, for example. A few words about micro crack propagation in gears. <clears throat> uh, this is still a little bit uh, discussed in the in research communities, but normally uh, people are following a kind of description of this why a micro crack grows in a gear or why why it grows from the surface down into the material so uh, as you if you know something about gear teeth interaction you know that uh, there is a there's a difference between the driver gear teeth and the driven gear teeth so the forces it's uh, the the forces uh, if the motion of the contact it starts down here on the driver and it moves uh, along the gear tooth flank up to the end of contact up here it's the opposite on the driven part then it, the the contact starts up here and it goes down like this so 
So, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and the attractive forces they are then also directed in different directions here. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, what we normally say is that uh, if the attractive force is opposite to the motion, like here, uh, this is the contact, it moves in this direction, but the friction is like in this direction. You, that means that you open up the crack, this is the kind of initial, uh, some, some start of the crack, you open up the crack due to the friction, while moving the contact over it and you fill the, the crack with fluid, the lubricant that is present. It's trapped, the fluid is trapped in the crack, but then you close the, the mouth of the, of, the, of the crack with the, with the contact itself. And then due to the stresses when the, when the contact is passing by, you create a lot high fluid pressure and and the the fluid pressure is move, causing the crack to grow further to it kind of kind of cause a high stress in the in the fluid and will dig deeper into the material so and that this is happening down here then where where you have a, a different direction of the uh, so it's normally occurs here below the pitch circle where the tractive force and the motion is in opposite directions. A few words also about uh, how the lambda parameter influenced uh, uh, the micropitting or the occurrence of micropitting. You remember that lambda is, the, is a parameter describing the lubrication quality which is the the, the minimum film thickness of the lubricating film divided by the surface roughness height. So uh, a high lambda means good lubrication, a low lambda poor lubrication. <laughs> but actually, in in uh, when it comes to micropitting, the worst case is a kind of intermediate uh, lambda. It's not a very low lambda because at very low lambda, you have a you, you have a wear taking place instead so you wear off the cracks and all the initiated cracks are worn off so you can't uh, grow them further to uh, cause uh, uh, to create a pit so actually at low lambda wear is dominating and pitting is less uh, uh, a smaller problem so <clears throat> this uh, this is uh, a typical plot then of, of wear of course wear is increasing when you have a poor lubrication like this and uh, and micropitting is also reduced when you have a better lubrication because you have a better damping of of, uh, of the stresses and you don't create as strong stress concentrations but then it it at, as i said then at low lambdas you have a smaller risk for micropitting too and that leads to a kind of maximum uh, or maximum risk at some kind of intermediate lambda still this lambda is pretty small but uh, but it's uh, uh, you should be aware of that that micropitting may if you if you reduce the wear you may end up in micropitting instead in, in railway you have a similar problem <clears throat> you in railway they they grind the the rail from time to time so that grinding is the kind of wear process uh, sliding wear process so so you 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 grind oh, the reason why you grind the rail is to remove the the cracks initiated at the surface so if you grind very often you you will not have any pitting on the other hand you consume the rail surface and it's very expensive to do the grinding too so you you don't want to grind too often on the other hand it, it you then may end up in pitting problems so so there is a kind of kind of uh, best uh, possible uh, grinding interval uh, strategy here on also the, uh, 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 there is should also then be an optimum roughness of the rail surface i guess uh, a few words also about uh, the effect of ep or and or anti-wear additives on the bearing life 
this is a work by Wan and co-authors uh, showing that the EP has a strong effect of the of the life. So in the EP, which is it's good for a gearbox, for example, it's very good for the gear to avoid scuffing. But uh, in the gearbox, you also have bearings, and uh, the life uh, of the bearing are then hampered by the, these additives because you corrode the surface you you create something you, you change the properties of the of the of the surface top surface uh, layers of the of the materials and that is then causing uh, could could uh, the fatigue process is uh, accelerated of that reason when it comes to anti-wear there could be another problem if you have an anti-wear additive present there you don't wear in you don't run in the surfaces as fast you you, you maintain the roughness you have on the surfaces so you maintain the the micro uh, stress concentrations on the top surface so of that reason you get you you get you maintain the you you will continue to have those stress concentrations and then you of that reason accelerate the the, um, the micro pitting process so it's uh, additives are not are normally not very good for uh, for fatigue wear uh, please also remember that uh, fatigue phenomena are very stochastic it's uh, statistical problems in a way because it's uh, you don't really know especially the sub surface initiated it comes from impurities but that's also uh, but also the surface initiated comes from surface roughness which in itself is a kind of stochastic phenomena so so it's very difficult to predict when for a specific bearing when fatigue will take place what you normally do is to make a number of tests, for example, with a number of bearings or a number of uh, similar tribo tests, and they they happen to fall on a distribution which is called a Weibull uh, probability distribution. Weibull was a Swedish uh, statistics uh, researcher in the mid 1900s, and uh, and uh, he found that uh, by that they normally you had a certain distribution of the of the cases here so and they fall on the line on the on the speci specific plot you can see you can see here that it's a strange uh, scale here so uh, but they fall on a straight line in that strange scale so uh, that's that's something to remember so you need to do a, i don't know 20 30 tests to to be sure where this, uh, uh, where you can get this line. If you only have one point, you don't, you can't really draw the line here. So that means that you can predict uh, the fatigue life for a group of similar components, but you can't predict the fatigue life of one specific individual of that component. This is a picture showing pitting damage uh, of gears, and it's a typical damage uh, coming then from uh, surface initiated fatigue. And you you can see here that it it occurs here in in, in the middle of the gear flank, and uh, this is a zoomed in picture of that uh, V-shaped damage that occurs, and it actually started here. And you see it, it started below the pitch line. And as I said before, that, uh, that is when the, uh, when the traction force and the contact motion is in opposite direction. So it's, um, but this, this is typical damage of the surface. So how to design now for, to avoid the pitting of the two types. If you want to avoid, uh, uh, pitting the macro pitting, you, you keep the Hertz pressure down it's not easy uh, normally but uh, but the lower the pressure is the better it is keep the lambda ratio high uh, I mean the lubrication quality that's always good uh, uh, try to use materials that are free from impurities so it's uh, steels that are are specifically made for that to uh, for uh, for low 
pitting uh, for a high pitting life i mean uh, you should avoid tensile stresses because that's uh, that's uh, increasing the the fatigue uh, process so you can do that by introducing compressive residual stresses in the surface <clears throat> that you can do by different surface finishing techniques but also the hardening techniques uh, uh, and, uh, and the thermal treatments of the other materials keep the high hardness high always good and keep friction uh, lubrication good and use lubricant that gives you low friction that is typically better to use synthetic lubricants than uh, mineral oils because they normally give you a 10-20% lower friction and then that also means lower risk for macro pitting. When it comes to micro pitting then you, you need to keep the surface uh, the pressure peaks on the surface down and that you can do by keeping the roughness slope down so the uh, should be as small slopes on the on the asperities as possible as i said you should avoid the resonance lambda of course you can try to have maximize the lambda but if you can't uh, it's uh, it's uh, actually better to have a low lambda than a intermediate lambda if you want to avoid micro pitting but then you will end up in wear problems instead so that could be a problem instead then. clean materials is good also in this case uh, tensile stresses uh, should be avoided even also here uh, <clears throat> hardness is good to keep high uh, again the softer uh, surface should be the rougher surface and that's a tribology rule you should remember uh, you may have coatings but then they should be thick enough to avoid that you have very high stress concentrations in the interface between the coating and the base material uh, having low alpha lubricant is good why is that and what is alpha you may ask alpha is a number telling you about the pressure viscosity of a, of a lubricant and if you have very high alpha it means that you have a very high viscosity and that leads to high pressure peaks but low love uh, alpha normally gives you lower pressure peaks and then also lower risk for micro pitting again it's also good for for uh, with the low friction lubrication here because then you keep the, the stress levels down and additives should be designed for the purpose of, the, of that lubricated component it's as i said before it's it's a problem of course when you want to lubricate a, a gearbox and in the gearbox you have bearings so bearings and gears they don't have the same need for lubrication so sometimes a bearing must operate with a with an additive that it's not designed for really so that's all for now about pitting it's a very complex uh, phenomenon actually so it, I, should have needed uh, many hours actually but uh, this is a this was a kind of introduction so thank you very much